On the morning of September 7th, 1978, Bulgarian writer and expatriate Georgi Markov was on his way to work at the BBC in London when his life took a fatal, if nearly imperceptible, turn. He was waiting for a bus near the Waterloo Bridge when out of nowhere he felt a sharp pain in the back of his right thigh, like a bee sting or the prick of a needle. He turned around to check his leg, but found nothing out of the ordinary. He did, however, notice another man nearby in the crowd of commuters, bending over to pick an umbrella off the street. This man mumbled something that sounded like an apology in a foreign accent, then stood up, hurried across the street, and disappeared into a taxi. Markov initially thought nothing more of it, but when he arrived at the BBC offices, the dull throbbing in his leg had not lessened, and he discovered a small red wound had formed in the surface of his skin. Over the course of the day, Markov began to feel increasingly weak and ill. One of his co-workers noticed that he looked grey in the face. His condition steadily worsened to the point that he had to be admitted to a hospital with a high fever that same evening. Markov, a dissident of the Soviet Union, an enemy of the state in his native Bulgaria, had been poisoned. It was one of the most devious acts of spycraft ever documented, and the umbrella incident stood out as an important clue. What happened during that fateful encounter on the street? Could an umbrella really have been turned into a secret weapon? And who was the mystery umbrella man who seemingly disappeared, never to be seen again? The most ominous public threats to Markov had begun back in 1972, when the Union of Bulgarian Writers officially suspended Markov's membership. At the time, Markov was already living in London as an exiled dissident after his anti-Soviet writing had become increasingly popular and controversial back in Bulgaria. With Markov seemingly out of reach, the Bulgarian government sentenced him in absentia to six years and six months in prison for defection. Cultural officials sought to make him a pariah in his home country, his works were removed from bookstores and libraries, and his name was blacklisted in the media. The Bulgarian Secret Service soon opened their file on Markov under the code name Wanderer and shared his case with the KGB, Russia's secret police. Between 1975 and 1978, Markov wrote and produced In Absentia Reports, a radio program that documented, analyzed, and criticized life in communist Bulgaria prior to his exile. They were broadcast on Radio Free Europe, a news organization funded covertly by the US and the CIA as a mode of spreading anti-communist propaganda across the European continent and to Soviet satellite countries. Its headquarters were frequently broken into by the KGB, who attempted to destroy signal towers and regularly jammed its frequencies. By this point in time, the Cold War had reached a fever pitch. The Kremlin had become increasingly paranoid about dissidents and defectors, especially those who left the USSR with state secrets and inner knowledge of how the regime functioned. Markov's broadcasts, in which he relayed stories of how Bulgaria's general secretary, Todor Zhivkov, and his inner circle lived and the disinformation they spread, began to find their way into homes and mines back in the Eastern Bloc. Markov received warnings from the state, delivered through his family still living there, that he was to cease his Radio Free Europe broadcasts immediately or there would be, quote, serious consequences. In January 1978, Markov's brother received a phone call from a fellow Bulgarian expatriate. A secret party meeting had been held in Bulgaria the previous November, and the decision had been made to have Georgi Markov eliminated. Georgi, however, dismissed the threat as an intimidation tactic, and continued to broadcast on Radio Free Europe undaunted. However, co-workers at the BBC recall Georgi becoming nervous about spending his night shifts alone in the office and he began being very careful about everything he ate or drank. The poisoning of Georgi Markov occurred on the morning of September 7th, which also happened to be Secretary Zhivkov's birthday, a fact which, in the investigation following his death, was assumed not to be a coincidence. Immediately following Markov's hospitalization that day, he had made his doctor aware of what he suspected was going on. He said that he had been poisoned by the KGB and that there was nothing that could be done to save his life. Four days later, on September 11th, he died of a cardiac arrest. Details of Markov's death were made public the next day, and the media had a field day with the spectacular details of the story. A narrative emerged that the man with the umbrella that Markov had seen on the bridge that morning had been a Russian spy. Also, that the umbrella itself was the murder weapon, that the assassin had jabbed Markov in the leg with its sharp, poison tip, Markov himself had supposedly floated this theory around to his doctors and his wife. 
the London Metropolitan Police ordered a thorough autopsy. After consulting with doctors and being made aware of Markov's controversial status as a defector and the suspicious circumstances surrounding his death, the swollen red welt on the back of his leg had grown, but the forensic pathologist conducting the autopsy also made a startling discovery within the wound. They discovered a small platinum pellet, the size of a pinhead, lodged in the tissue where he had felt a twinge on that fateful morning. Closer inspection showed the pellet had two tiny holes, a fraction of a millimeter in diameter, drilled into its sides. A chemical analysis of the material found inside this cavity uncovered traces of ricin, a lethal toxin that can kill human beings even in incredibly small doses, especially when administered directly into the bloodstream. The toxic ricin had been sealed into the pellets with a sugary substance that was designed to melt away at the temperature of the human body. It seemed clear to the detectives from Scotland Yard that the pellet had been lodged via projectile into Markov's leg from a distance. Its walls then dissolved over time, and the poison found its way into his veins, eventually killing him while allowing the assassin plenty of time to escape unnoticed. Adding fuel to the fire was a parallel investigation already underway in Paris. Ten days before Markov's murder, another Bulgarian defector, Vladimir Kostov, had been poisoned in the same manner in a crowded Paris metro station. He was taken to the hospital, where doctors found the same type of pellet lodged in his skin. However, fortunately for Kostov, the sugar-based walls keeping the ricin in the pellet had not dissolved properly, and only a minuscule amount of the poison had leaked out into his blood. Kostov survived his high fever and lived through the attack on his life. The KGB was suspected of both attacks, as poisoning was known to be a preferred method of theirs. Many fascinated by the case returned to the conspicuous umbrella that Markov described in trying to solve its missing pieces. The umbrella, it was thought, could have been designed by the KGB as a stealth gun, specifically tailored for covert, broad daylight assassination attempts like those made on Markov and Kostov. The umbrella assassin became an easy sell to the media due to its theatricality, but it's never been clear whether such a weapon would have been possible or practical. Investigators working the case thought it much more likely that something like a gas pistol would have been used, and that the umbrella was simply a distraction, or perhaps something used to conceal the actual murder weapon. We may never know what method was used to lodge the poison pellet into Markov's leg. No arrests have ever been made in his murder, though many KGB defectors have come out in the decades since and claimed, without a shadow of a doubt, that the secret police were indeed behind the attack. Much of the documentation surrounding the case was found to be missing or destroyed, and investigators suspected that a cover-up had been made by Bulgarian intelligence. The reports and communications they did uncover showed that the Bulgarian police and the KGB were in constant communication over what to do with Markov, and the two high-ranking members of the Bulgarian Secret Service visited Moscow two months before the murder. According to the same files, an Italian man, Francesco Giulino, codenamed Piccadilly, was recruited to be the assassin. The reports show several training documents and payments being sent to Piccadilly, a likely reference to London's Piccadilly Circus. Giulino has never confessed to any of the accusations made against him, and there is no official proof linking him to the attack aside from these coded reports. A recent British documentary on the attack revealed that Giulino is alive, traveling nomadically across Europe. Although the case has since become one of the most famous spy incidents of the Cold War, many details, it seems, remain in the dark. <laughs>